Hello. Hello everyone and welcome to our session. We are the Inuit Circumpolar Council and some of the uh, newly elected leadership uh, is here with me today. My name is Sara Olsvi, uh, the International Chair of Inuit Circumpolar Council. Uh, we work in four-year terms and we will be telling you a little bit about our mandate for this four-year term that just was started uh, at our General Assembly this summer. Miningwa uh, Kleist will be introducing uh, my colleagues and uh, uh, friends here in the panel as we move ahead. Uh, but I'm very, very happy that uh, uh, we are here together with uh, both Canadian, Alaskan, Inuit leadership and also very honored and thankful that we have the uh, previous uh, international chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, Dr. Daly Sambodoro, with us. Daly and Royana. <laughs> it is actually the first time we meet in person since our General Assembly. And as you can probably imagine, for an organization as ours, where our members and our people live across such a vast area from Chukotka, Canada, Alaska, Greenland, as you see on the map, to have our physical in-person meetings is essential to our cooperation. It is essential to us as Inuit to feel the connectedness, to talk to each other and know what's going on far away in each and every little settlement of our people. We are about 180,000 living across the Arctic. And in addition to that, there are a lot of, lots of Inuit living south of the Arctic around the world. The Inuit Circumpolar Council was established in 1977. This was during the Cold War, and it was difficult to become truly united across of these state borders, as you can probably imagine. Today, we are a uh, well-known and established international in indigenous peoples organization. And for 45 years, we have been working on many different platforms, nationally, regionally, internationally, bringing the voice of Inuit to uh, a various uh, number of negotiations, uh, both on our issues, but also on general indigenous peoples issues, such as the negotiations on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So for 45 years, we have brought indigenous and Inuit diplomacy to the world stage. And I truly believe that we have added value to the negotiations among states, amongst, among peoples and also added value to the understanding of the importance of including all peoples in these negotiations. Today, we, apart from holding our ECOSOC accreditation uh, in the UN, as you know, we are a permanent participant to the Arctic Council. We have recently also uh, a new position as a in, uh, as a provisional consultative status in the International Maritime Organization, and we are observers in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So the very important international institutions and forums where states negotiate, many of them have recognized how important it is to have indigenous peoples included, and we do our best to live up to that in our everyday work with the resources and capacity we have. Our General Assembly was able to be held because we did a hybrid meeting. That was initially decided uh, because of COVID. In the meantime, February happened and it turned out to be the only way possible. But I was very, very happy and proud that we were able to gather the 66 delegates, so all of the, the delegates from the four nation states of where Inuit live to our General Assembly uh, on the hybrid platform that we were able to use, and that we were able to also negotiate and adopt unanimously a General Assembly declaration, which lays out our mandate for the next four years. And our seven uh, main priorities are listed here, good governance, Security and Inuit Nunad, 
health and wellness of our people, as many of you have probably heard throughout this conference where our many representatives, not only through ICC, but also through other indigenous peoples organizations and not least youth, have been able to inform about our issues at the many different sessions, also on our health and wellness issues. Language and culture, hunting and food security, Arctic Ocean and the marine environment, one of the big issues in the coming years in the negotiations on the Central Arctic Ocean's fisheries agreement. Here our message is that other instruments about Arctic governance, such as the UNCLOS, were finalized without the involvement of indigenous peoples now indigenous peoples must be included. And finally, the infrastructure deficit that we all know about us that live in the Arctic. During a pandemic, we saw and felt this deficit in the form of lack of access to health services and being more vulnerable because of that for our peoples. So these are the main priorities, but they are of course all overarched by the biggest challenge of our lifetime and that is climate change. So I look forward to our debate, and I'm very happy also that the uh, uh, head of the Greenland government, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, has agreed to moderate, and he will take us through uh, the next uh, a little more than half an hour in going into more depth with our uh, new uh, General Assembly declaration. Royana. Yeah, my name is Miningwa Kleist and I'm the Permanent Secretary of the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Business and Trade in, in Greenland. And I have the honor to, to moderate this distinguished group of, of Inuit leaders. Um, we had an almost similar panel in, in Nuuk in August at the Arctic Circle Greenland Forum. Um, we'll do a little bit like that then uh, where I will introduce each and every one, and uh, after uh, the one person, or the persons have been introduced, um, I'll ask them to, to come up with their priorities uh, from the, um, and what they find are the most important points in, in the ICC declaration. And then I will have one question afterwards, and then it's up to you to ask questions. Um, we, we take the spirit of democracy the spirit of Arctic Circle series here, and we like diversity in questions, so we'll open up for the floor uh, after my first question. <laughs> All right. So if we begin from the end, Doreen, yes, <laughs> or the furthest. <laughs> Good Doreen, afternoon. Doreen Levitt from ICC Alaska. Uvanga Doreen, I'll hook Levitt. I'm in Inupak from Utkavik. My Appa and Akka were Utuk and Savluruk Akpik Sr. My parents were Florence and Robert Fogg. One word I can describe as the Inuit Circumpolar Council's theme of strength and peace is a tauchikan, meaning together. ICC was founded with the vision of strength and unity by Eben Hobson Sr., also from Utkavik. The vision remains true today and is reflected in the theme of the Declaration. A priority for Alaska in the last 15 years has been food security and sovereignty. I sit on the Food Sovereignty Committee and it's something that I hold near and dear to my heart, coming from a hunting, a fishing, and a whaling family. With regards to our food sovereignty efforts, we developed an action plan towards achieving that sovereignty, meaning we want to ensure Inuit are involved in the management of our traditional food resources to sustain it for future generations. Not to be just consulted, not to just sit at that table, but we own that table. Any policies, any policies that impact Inuit food sovereignty needs to have Inuit making those decisions. In many instances, others who are not Inuit or even live in the Arctic talk about the Arctic's food security for their own agenda. Many, have, many who have never even been to the Arctic, but they are not in the coexistence like we are with resource development, and our region is living proof that we can coexist. As Inuit, we are adaptable and must continue to be that way. 
Our overall goal is cultural sustainability. At the circumpolar level, as stated in the declaration, we want a unified pan-Arctic Inuit voice concerning the protection, the access, sharing, and management of our food systems. Food sovereignty intersects with many other issues identified by the declaration, including research. Inuit want and need to set and drive the Arctic research agenda. We want our indigenous knowledge to be utilized and considered actual and real science, without, just like Western science is accepted without a question. We want climate change addressed because it is affecting our food security now and will affect our cultural sustainability into the future. One of the projects in my local region um, is working with local whaling captains and ensuring that our sigaloks, which means our ice cellars, can stay frozen throughout the years. We are installing thermosiphons for those captains who choose to participate. And this is just an example that us as Inuit have the solutions to adapt and mitigate the effects of climate change. Kuyunakbuk and Kuyunakbuk to my fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll take the next, Dali Sampodoro, mm -hmm. former chair, international chair of ICC. Mm -hmm. First, uh, allow me to acknowledge the <coughs> transition of leadership, the new leadership, the new blood of the Inuit Circumpolar Council. I'm very, very pleased to uh, recognize the, uh, not only the past contributions, but the, the future contributions. As well, I want to recognize and acknowledge all the Inuit in the room. It is your, yeah, 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 it is your organization. Uh, some of you may remember in 2018 when I was elected as the chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council that every Inuk counts and this means each of you and honestly this is your organization and one of my uh, personal endeavors throughout my term was to outreach to those that are not formally or officially within the ICC, but to extend and create opportunities for those that are outside of the formal staff of the ICC. And I, I hope that this uh, objective continues uh, well into the future. Very quickly, three points. The first is the importance of the Inuit Circumpolar Council as an indigenous people's organization whose traditional territory reflected on this map is significant in every Arctic discussion and every issue facing Arctic indigenous peoples, including Inuit, but Arctic peoples overall. And uh, the point that uh, has been made by Doreen of owning the table recognize the traditional territory of our people. And significantly, we're talking about uh, miles of coastline, hence the importance of the marine environment. The point about the significance of the ICC is our consistency and the durability of the organization. Doreen spoke about uh, the emergence of the Inuit Circumpolar Council. We have been consistent and prepared to take on the issues that face us. Unlike government administrations that change, ambassadors that get reposted, we, on the other hand, have been consistent and expressed our durability throughout all kinds of administrations and changes that we've seen, not least of which is climate change. Also, in every objective we've set out, we've shown up, we've occupied the space. Whatever particular venue it happens to be, we've come prepared to engage and contribute in significant ways based upon a human rights framework, but more significantly, I think, based upon our unique and distinct worldview and perspective uh, that is undergirded by the relationship that we have to our Arctic environment. And I think this is a legacy that uh, really has been built upon the words of our founder, Eben Hobson. So again, through the diplomacy that Sarah spoke of, uh, we have been prepared to engage. And 
here again in the next uh, four years, uh, occupying the space at the International Maritime Organization. We're the only indigenous people's organization that has status within the IMO. As I said, the marine environment is important to us. Only logical that Inuit are there and speaking autonomously outside of government and other NGOs to represent our own views and our own concerns, our own interests, as well as um, our own hopes and desires for uh, safeguarding the marine environment. The work at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, significant contributions there, especially in the way of indigenous knowledge, and not only on behalf of our own people, but all indigenous peoples to try to open up this space of science and further the effort, advance the effort of indigenous knowledge within a space that has been traditionally occupied by hard scientists, for lack of a, a, a better term, and more of an embrace of indigenous knowledge. I also want to mention uh, the important role that we played in the Food and Agriculture Organization and the uh, decision at the UN Food Systems Summit to put in place a coalition on indigenous people's food systems. This is huge for us because typically the FAO has looked at uh, agriculture and other forms of food security. We want to bring forward through our own voices our way of life, our food systems in terms of hunting, fishing, and harvesting. There's so much more that I could say about uh, some of the other international treaties that we're working to influence, such as the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement, uh, as well as the uh, biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. All this is to say that being engaged means we have to have more people, more resources. The final point I want to make is uh, something I've already alluded to, and that is the fact that we have much to contribute. We have extended invitations to many institutions to collaborate and cooperate with us, and also uh, to create the space that allows us to offer what we have in the way of <clears throat> excuse me, solutions and knowledge uh, about the distinct Arctic environment. Um, so I'm hopeful that this extension our extension of our own hands, our own minds, uh, and, and our, our distinct features is undertaken to ensure, and this is something that many people forget, to ensure that we are able to effectively enjoy and exercise our human rights as indigenous peoples in every Arctic context. So, Kiana. Thank you, Dali. And next, Lisa Kubakwaluk, President ICC Canada, Vice Chair ICC International from Nunavik. Hey, <laughs> uh, You may see in the, ma in the map uh, where I come from, Nunavik, and that's right beside Nunatsiavut. Uh, thank you for welcoming us. And as you can hear, um, there is so much going on. Um, so much work at um, ICC. And our declaration uh, is really uh, under the theme of Inuit, strength and peace. Inuit, sunguninga, seimaninga. And so those, this theme is very important to us in, in so many ways. Um, all the work that we are doing is very much based on our strength. Um, and so there are several passages, one of which uh, Daly mentioned, um, that are related to the marine environment in our declaration. And um, due to the importance of the ocean to our culture, our well-being, um, the ecosystem, the marine uh, biodiversity, uh, which our culture is so intricately tied. And the more and more I mention how intricately tied it is, um, the more I myself realize that basically uh, the environment, the land that we know, the ice, the sea, uh, the marine mammals, the ecosystem, 
It's all really the foundation of our culture, our knowledge. And the work that we do is very much uh, based on our indigenous knowledge, which ties in to self-determination. Um, there's a lot going on. There are a lot of changes happening in the Arctic due to climate change. So we see an increase of shipping coming in through the Arctic, passing through the Arctic. There's underwater noise. There's an increase of black carbon deposits on the snow and ice, which is forcing climate change as well. Um, there are lack of marine infrastructure. Uh, if we want to see ships um, with uh, alternative types of fuels. Uh, if they wish to change fuel in the Arctic, there is no infrastructure to welcome them. Um, there is uh, uh, all these types of um, uh, risks too, to uh, collisions of ships. Uh, so we must find safe corridors of passage. Um, and um, there is also uh, uh, the need to uh, ensure that no spills of uh, uh, heavy fuel oil happen in our Arctic waters. Uh, so um, it brings me to say that um, marine governance is um, something that um, we have um, within uh, our declaration. <coughs> Um, for us, meaning for us to sit at the table, to be part of the decision making, uh, to influence policy makers, um, to participate in the formulation of the rules and regulations around the ships passing through Arctic waters, but also ensuring that protection of the marine environment is happening, not just uh, within the Arctic waters, but outside of the, the Arctic, uh, due to the ships near the Arctic. So um, uh, that brings me to say that we've been engaging at the International Maritime Organization for the past several years and have uh, gained a provisional consultative status. So we have the next couple of years to show how much we contribute to the International Maritime Organization. And, um, and we are, we're doing it, we're working. We're within the working groups and the committees showing how much our knowledge, indigenous knowledge, Inuit knowledge, is important in the whole process. Mm. Much more to say, but. <laughs> Fair enough. Mm. And next in line, Gubik Fantasy Kleist. Uh, President of ICC Greenland, Vice Chair, uh, ICC International. Thank you. Um, ladies of many words, uh, we have only <laughs> 16 minutes left now. <laughs> um, so I wanted to just uh, really briefly, so that we can leave some time for questions, flag this publication, the latest one from the ICC, about Circumpolar Inuit Protocols for Equitable and Ethical Engagement. I got uh, three copies left uh, of, of the report and the recommendations and three pamphlets pre presenting the protocols. Um, what I wanted to say really is that um, Inuit in our language means human beings. And uh, so you are all belonging to ICC because uh, you regard yourself as human beings, I guess. <laughs> uh, and uh, also I see a lot of Gadashit Greenlanders amongst the, uh, the uh, audience. Uh, it was not like that when, when Arctic Circle started back uh, nine years ago, next year is 10 years already. Um, so that's what I wanted to say in, in uh, as a starter and uh, hoping for really, really tough and difficult <laughs> questions for the ladies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a man of few words, not too many. That's me. Well, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> I'll have one question for you. Um, 
as you see, the, the Inu Inu Nat is, is a very vast area, a very big area. If that was a nation state, that was a big one. Um, mm. But um, it is not. And we have borders mm. in between us, nation borders, state borders. Um, so I'd like to hear your views and thoughts about Inuit mobility and connectivity. Um, mm -hmm. from each your own perspectives, uh, from where you come from, mm. uh, because that, that is unique compared to, to um, yeah, the thoughts and you must have. Mm. So, who would like to say something? Yeah, Dali. I think that the, um, the recent developments uh, will impact this particular issue significantly. As many may know, as far back as 1977 and the first invitations that Evan Hobson made, especially to our relations in Chikotka and then Soviet Union, um, to attend the organizing conference, the, the matter of the imposed borders between us has been on the radar of the Inuit Circumpolar Council. In terms of uh, the recent developments, it's highly significant that uh, mobility and uh, Inuit mobility specifically in the Hans Island Agreement um, and the, the recognition of the importance of uh, travel um, in relation to that particular border which is also echoed in uh, the recommendations of the original ICC Pikela Sosuak uh, Commission. So I think there's much to, to build upon, uh, and there seems to be more of a, of a climate uh, to really entertain ways to erase these borders uh, in favor of Inuit which has significance in terms of not only us as individuals or families or communities and our ability to unify our people, but also, in, in my estimation, is significant in terms of the management of the resources that we depend upon. As, as someone said uh, the other day that we as human beings, we're the only ones who pay attention to these borders, right? Uh, uh, they, the rest of the natural world uh, does not. So I think there's important precedent to build upon, and I'm sure others have other thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, first of all, we should remember that the borders between states were invented much later than the people themselves. So it's, it's a relatively new thing. Uh, and uh, as it was said, the, the environment, the, the birds, the fish, uh, and the wildlife doesn't care about uh, uh, state borders because they're artificial. Once I, I remember when I first joined the ICC that there was this dream of forming an Inuit nation. Mm. Uh, it would be a, a beautiful dream uh, one day if it comes true. Um, and as Daly mentioned, uh, the Big uh, Elasso Commission is recommending, one of the recommendations is that uh, Inuit can travel freely amongst each, each other. And I hope that the uh, Greenland government uh, also accepts uh, our recommendation on that and that uh, the work uh, with, with the Canadian government will uh, be a bit speedier than it is today. Because, um, <laughs> Yeah, and we need money as well. Uh, um, because nature and climate change doesn't wait for us to, to make decisions. It, it moves on every day. And uh, being, being an Arctic uh, Inuit, being Arctic Inuit, we can watch the climate change happening just looking out the window. So uh, hurry up, make your act, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Sarah? Yes, and we have talked about the borders a few times, but just to illustrate, uh, of course, we are, today there is Inuit who use the hunting grounds 
and do travel across the borders, but it's only possible for some, mm. the way that the world works today. So it, there is inequity in the question of mobility as well as, as we know it now. Um, of course, the good uh, initiatives that are taken are very important to follow through, but I just also wanted to add some of the philosophy uh, behind our um, theme of our General Assembly, Inuit Strength and Peace. It's never possible to translate our uh, own indigenous language into English. It sounds nice and easy to say strength and peace, and many people know what it means. Uh, in our own language, the word is actually not a word that many uh, we hear Galatlit know. We were um, uh, guided by some elders and knowledgeable persons who knew this word, and it means more than strength. It also means stability and perseverance can be understood as that, because it's about how a boat can be stable on water. And also the word peace. In our own language, in the Gadatlisut language, there's other Inuit languages, is a reciprocal thing. It is that you and I are peaceful together. So, so I think those philosophies behind our theme for this four-year term are, are the ones we are bringing with us in every effort that we will be working with. Yeah. Thank you. Only eight minutes. Only left. eight minutes. No. Now let's ask some questions together. Do I see some hands? I'll open up the floor now. Yeah, we have over here. And please uh, state your name and perhaps also affiliation. Yeah, uh, my name is Berkur Helki. I'm a student at the Reykjavik University. And I've heard that in Greenland in particular, there's a big problem with depression. And I'm wondering if the organization has any objectives there. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe Elisa could say something about it. But I'm not in Greenland, but I can yeah. speak to it but too. But we yeah. can yes. at yeah. least start by saying that we in the Inuit Service for the Council for many years have worked with uh, the issue of mental health. It has been an integrated part of our view of health in general for many, many years. And we have a Circumpolar Inuit Health Steering Committee that has been working on many, many very wonderful initiatives, including some of those that have been uh, conducted during, uh, throughout the uh, working group uh, work of the Arctic Council that focus on mental health and suicide prevention. Uh, and I think actually that you can say that f through the work of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, um, we at a very early stage put focus on the issue of mental health among our peoples in the Arctic and, and among other indigenous peoples. And as you have probably heard at many of the sessions where youth, indigenous youth have been telling more in depth and detail about the conditions <coughs> we see and live under in our countries, there's a lot of different factors that, that affect our mental health. Uh, and it is a long haul and, but a necessary um, uh, effort that needs to be done on all levels of governance from governments, but also from a grassroots level to make sure that we actually find the good uh, ways of conducting health services that are the ones that work in our societies. Mm -hmm. And what we see very often is that being former colonies, a lot of our health services and social systems are adopted from the South. So the efforts that we do, for example, in the Health Steering Committee of ICC is to look at how do we make, for example, midwifery uh, in a way that suits our country. Today in Greenland, you can only give birth in four or five places. What does that do to the family who has to travel very far to give birth? And what are the social, cultural, identity consequences of that, just as an example? So it's all intertwined, and our uh, initiatives on this area are something that we work very seriously with through our steering committee that does a wonderful work. Lisa? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, mental health is a very important issue right now, a lot, especially for our youth. And so um, Sarah has already mentioned the initiatives uh, made by uh, our uh, health committee 
and we have activities that are organized through the Arctic, uh, well, what, what is or was the Arctic Council. Um, but within our communities, we also realize that we need to bring more training uh, within uh, Inuit communities themselves to help fellow Inuit. And then there are larger changes that have happened within our family as well that um, impact on the mental health of youth. You know, the sedentary living has, has brought a lot of Inuit into uh, these larger towns now. And that has changed a lot of the dynamic. Uh, the nine to five salary living is not so adapted to Inuit way of life. And so it means less opportunity for Inuit to go out on the land. And the best thing that, that has been uh, good for the well-being is being out on the land, connecting to our environment, connecting to our knowledge, connecting to our families. The family structure, the Inuit family structure is unique in that it's not the same either as the Western family structure. It had its rules around it. It had its kinship relations, which to me is the basis of our Inuit law. And when that family structure is broken, we need to mend it back. And how do we do this? Being out on the land, being out on our environment, getting to know our culture, our survival skills, our values, our knowledge. So that's one aspect of, of uh, the question that I would like to bring to you. Thank you. <laughs> Kubik, the man, yeah, a few words. Another aspect is that it's, it's not only for Greenland. Mm. Um, it's a byproduct of colonialism, mm. I would say, for all indigenous peoples around the world. Mm. So my, my message would be decolonize, firstly, your minds. Mm. Decolonize us. Decolonize. It could be viewed as, as an individual problem. It usually is uh, mental sickness. But it's, for us, it's a collective syndrome, which many of us suffer from. Mm -hmm. Open up again. Two minutes. Over here. There's a lady yeah. over there. Yeah. State your name and affiliation. Thank you. My name is Caitlin, and <coughs> I am a, a proud big sister of a new Vialuit man. And I join you today as a representative uh, with the Legislative Assembly of the Northwest Territories. Um, I wanted to ask a question about infrastructure deficit. Um, across the Northwest Territories, we have a severe housing deficit. And I know that this has a large impact on um, my Inuvialuit friends, family, and neighbors. Um, we also have climate change, which is having a huge impact on that. Houses in Tuktaaktuk are literally falling into the Arctic Ocean. In uh, Ulahaktuk, people wake up to snowdrifts over top of their entire front door. In Polituk, snowdrifts are in their homes. And when uh, the government comes in and says, we have a home for your community, people are finding that that home does not reflect the cultural needs of that family. There's nowhere to prepare meat properly. There's nowhere to store meat properly. And so I was wondering if, given the commonality of challenges, if the ICC is working on housing design and what work is happening with the ICC as far as housing deficits. Thank you. I would have to say that um, this has plagued us. It, it, it's chronic, it's persistent. And uh, uh, the infrastructure that presently exists, as you've identified, is, is substandard, um, which is remarkable because we live in some of the wealthiest uh, regions on earth, right? Um, but in terms of your specific question, uh, at present, what we've uh, tried to do is identify uh, the issues and challenges, raise them and generate awareness in order to influence policy at the national level. As an international organization, um, 
We're, we've worked to identify specifically what the problems are, the linkages, and then uh, provide that information again in order to influence uh, policy domestically and, and at the national level. So not specifically in terms of housing design, cold climate design, things of that uh, nature. There are, there are people better suited to do so than uh, the ICC as an international organization. But the, the importance of all of the interrelated issues, which was, uh, has been said here at this assembly, um, in, in terms of overcrowding, uh, lack of potable water, um, the telecommunications, a whole host of things, they're all interrelated in terms of the infrastructure deficit. We use that broad term, but it means many, many different uh, interrelated things that require attention. Um, and on the part of national and, and domestic governments, uh, more funding and equitable funding and equitable access so that we can apply our own uh, knowledge and, and thought to generate solutions for things like housing that's more appropriate in communities. Yeah. We are out of time, but I will let Sarah close yep. here. Just very shortly, you saw the map. On the issue of infrastructure, on the issues of housing, we must ensure that our governments do not only look south for solutions. Mm. Look to the side. We share the challenges and we also have the solutions and we will learn about better solutions by looking towards other Inuit and other Arctic nations. Mm. Thank you. Thank you.